In the previous episode of this series, we followed Octavian in the west, from the end of Philippi in 42 BC, through the Perisene War, until the Treaty of Brandisium in late 40 BC. At the same time, however, events were transpiring in the east, and in this episode, we shall again begin in the immediate aftermath of Philippi, this time focusing on Mark Antony and Cleopatra, and the eventual Pompeian-Parthian invasion, which was a harbinger of what was to come for the next centuries of Roman history. We can offer a sneak preview of those centuries, and another look at the lives of Caesar and Octavian, with our sponsor Magellan TV, and their documentary series I, Caesar, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. It's a look at the lives of six Roman leaders and how their actions defined the history of the empire. In particular, episode 2 covers Augustus, who is, spoilers, the leader this Octavian we keep mentioning will eventually become, also known as the first emperor of Rome. See how he did it with expert historians to tell the tale, and then see the other episodes on Caesar, Nero, Hadrian, Constantine and Justinian for a wide picture of key times from the Empire's history. Then there's everything else on Magellan TV. They boast the richest and most varied history content available anywhere, covering everything from the ancient to modern eras, wars, biographies and the Earth itself. Aside from history, they've got extensive collections of science, true crime, travel and other documentaries. They add 15 or more hours of 4K high definition content every week for their subscribers at no extra cost. It's all viewable anytime, anywhere, on televisions, laptops, mobile devices and more. Get access to 3,500 hours of ad-free documentaries for only $4.99 a month, and get a month for free by subscribing to Magellan TV via our link in the description. Following the division of lands and legions that occurred after Philippi, Octavian returned to Italy while Antony briefly wintered in Athens, enjoying the literary and philosophical pleasures of the city before crossing to Asia Minor in the spring of 41 BC. Much of the area had sworn allegiance to Brutus and Cassius, and it was up to Antony to re-establish control over these provinces, as well as collect the funds to cover the Triumvir's colossal expenses. For cities that had sided with the liberators, such as many of the Ionian cities, a heavy tribute of nine years' worth of taxes was demanded. Kings, tyrants and vassals who had sided against him were replaced with pro-Caesarians. Powerful Romans, such as governors, came to him asking for mercy, Antony sparing most of these, except any that had been involved in or knew about the conspiracy to assassinate Caesar. At the same time, Antony was also careful to reward those who had remained loyal. The Rhodians, for example, were given more land, and he exempted the Lycians from taxes. It was a rare insight into how talented an administrator Antony could be, using threats and mercy in equal measure to quickly bring many of the eastern provinces back into the fold. During his journey around the provinces of Asia Minor, Antony was already planning for an invasion of Parthia, an invasion for which Egypt, Rome's most powerful vassal in the east, would be vital. As such, he requested that Cleopatra meet him in Cilicia. It is unlikely that this was the first time the two had met, as Antony had probably met Cleopatra when she lived in Rome for a time as Caesar's lover. However, it was apparently at this meeting that Antony, like Caesar before him, fell for Cleopatra's wit and beauty. Antony spent the summer in Syria, replacing tyrants and nobles who had sided with the liberators with pro-Caesarians, many of the deposed men fleeing to Parthia. Once this administration was handled, Antony travelled to Alexandria to spend the winter with his new lover, Cleopatra. As he had in Athens, Antony spent his time in Alexandria frequenting schools, temples and other places of learning, enjoying and embracing the Greek style of dress and way of life. He also spent a lot of time with Cleopatra, which eventually resulted in twins, Alexander and Cleopatra. His affinity for the Greek lifestyle and affair with Cleopatra would later be scorned by ancient historians. Appian wrote that he cared less and less for Roman affairs, obliging every one of Cleopatra's demands. Cassius Dio referred to Antony as Cleopatra's slave, and Plutarch wrote that Cleopatra dissipated and destroyed what good and saving qualities Antony had. These assessments are damning, but it is important to note that Roman sources such as these were almost uniformly scathing of powerful women 
and also influenced by later Augustan propaganda. Whether such claims about their relationship are true or not is impossible to say with certainty, but the alliance between the Triumvir and Queen was at least initially beneficial to both parties. On the one hand, Antony benefited from making sure that he had a strong Egyptian ally that he could rely upon for supplies and logistics to support his Parthian campaign. On the other, Cleopatra was able to use Antony's power to further her own position and remove her rivals, notably having her sister Arsinoe killed on Antony's orders. It was while Antony was in Alexandria, sometime in early 40 BC, that the Parthians began raiding Syria, led by Quintus Labienus, son of the renowned Titus Labienus, and the Parthian prince Pacorus. The precise size of the army is hard to distinguish, but it is hinted at being approximately 20,000, consisting of a mix of cataphracts and horse archers. Lucius Decidius Saxa, the governor Antony had appointed to the province, quickly gathered an army, likely around two legions, to fight the invaders, but was easily defeated in open battle by the more numerous Parthians and their excellent cavalry, with the Roman eagles being captured. Saxa fled to Antioch, and then Cilicia, but was soon caught and executed. Despite Antony's efforts in the east, there were still many Pompeian sympathizers, particularly in Syria, which had previously been Cassius's province. Moreover, Quintus Labienus's father had been an incredibly popular Pompeian military leader, and the Parthians brought with them a number of the Pompeians Antony had deposed. As a result, with Saxa dead, many garrisons and cities in Syria welcomed Quintus, surrendering without a fight, including Antioch. The force then split, Labienus pushing into Cilicia and Asia Minor, while Pacorus focused on subjugating the rest of Syria. With next to no resistance, he was able to seize control of almost the entire province, save for the notoriously well-defended city of Tyre, and pushed on to the Roman tributary of Judea, installing the anti-Roman Antigonus II as king. Labienus, meanwhile, was able to win over many cities in Cilicia, only facing serious resistance from Milassa and Alabanda both of which repelled initial attacks before eventually being taken and sacked. All of this had taken place in only a matter of months. Antony had thus far failed to act, either due to laziness and being too distracted by the luxuries of Alexandria, as Cassius Dio says, or because the Parthians had moved too fast for Antony to muster a concerted response. Either way, it wasn't until spring that he sailed from Alexandria to Tyre to address the issue. However, it was at this point that he received news of his brother and wife's defeat in Italy and of the loss of Gaul to Octavian. With his political position in jeopardy, Antony rushed back to Italy with the majority of his legions, effectively abandoning the eastern provinces. Their absence allowed Labienus to make even greater gains, pushing through the southern coast of Asia Minor to Ionia. Even Mithridates VI, one of the great enemies of Rome, had not been so successful. Despite Octavian and Antony managing to reconcile with the Treaty of Brundisium and Antony's marriage to Octavia, Sextus Pompey still presented a problem. The piracy and blockades of his fleet continued, and so did the famines. While Antony and Octavian were in Rome, the people, now at a breaking point, rioted in the Forum. Octavian, attempting to calm the crowd, was pelted with stones and attacked, forcing Antony to intervene, bringing soldiers into the Forum. The soldiers held back the crowd, but also killed some of the civilians, triggering a panic that resulted in the deaths of even more. It was clear that this could not continue. To prepare for peace talks, Octavian married Scribonia, the sister of Libo, one of Sextus's closest advisers. It was Libo who had facilitated the earlier alliance between Antony and Sextus, and he was once again vital, arranging a meeting of the three in Mycenaeum at the start of 39 BC. The negotiations started off poorly, Sextus assuming he would be offered a place in the triumvirate instead of Lepidus, which Antony and Octavian flatly refused. The negotiations continued, Antony and Octavian agreeing to forgive any who had been prescribed and to return part of their property to them. Many in Sextus's camp had been prescribed, and upon hearing this, they immediately jumped at the chance, pressuring Sextus to accept. 
Sextus had hoped to draw out negotiations, knowing that the famine put him in a powerful position that would only become stronger the longer he waited. Under the mounting pressure from his own faction though, Sextus was forced to make peace quickly. The trio had agreed to the following. Sextus would cease his blockades and piracy, remove any troops he still had in continental Italy, and immediately send grain to Rome. In return, the prescribed Pompeians would be allowed to return to Rome and have one quarter of their property restored. The many slaves that Sextus had welcomed into his army would be freed and rewarded fully upon completing their term of military service. And finally, Sextus would be allowed to govern Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica and Achaea. The treaty was sealed by another marriage, Sextus's daughter Pompeia, to Octavian's nephew Marcellus, the son-in-law of Antony. For how powerful a position Sextus had going into the negotiations, it was a relatively poor deal. He already had effective control of Sicily, Sardinia, and with his naval supremacy, likely could have taken Corsica with ease. The only real benefit he got was Achaea. Sextus was well aware of this and was furious at the advisers who had pressured him to accept, rather than allowing him to wait for better terms. Part of his faction even suggested that he act now and kill both Octavian and Antony, but Sextus refused. Meanwhile, Octavian and Antony had benefited from the treaty massively. The recalling of Sextus's ships and the grain he sent quickly ended the famine, and the two triumvirs returned to a hero's welcome in Rome. With affairs in Italy settled for now, Antony had quartered himself in Athens, simultaneously monitoring affairs in Italy and mustering his forces for a huge counter-invasion of Parthia, selecting his general Ventidius to confront Labienus and Pecorus. This was the same Ventidius that had been in Italy while Lucius Antony was besieged in Perusia and had not come to his aid. He was a novice homo, a new man, who had started as a mule driver before joining the army and serving under Caesar in Gaul. Little else is known about his early life, but he seems to have caught Caesar's eye as he was assigned as a praetor by the dictator in 43 BC. Since Caesar's assassination, he had also proved himself loyal to Antony and was one of the men Antony relied upon in the lead up to Mutina years earlier. He had held military commands, but never had control over a full campaign as he now did. The fact that Antony, a sound military strategist, entrusted command to him shows not only the level of trust Antony had in Ventidius, but perhaps also that Ventidius had correctly done what Antony would have wanted by not supporting Lucius. At the start of spring 39 BC, Ventidius crossed into Asia Minor with a force of probably four legions, alongside a sizable number of light infantry, aiming to establish a foothold for Antony. Though Labienus had moved quickly and seized a lot of land, he had thus far not been able to consolidate his position and had distanced himself significantly from his Parthian allies in Syria. The only force he had with him were local auxiliaries who had sided with him and perhaps two legions from Syria. Confronted with Ventidius's larger force, Labienus had little option but to retreat back to Cilicia to try and join forces with a portion of the Parthian force in Syria. Ventidius pursued, splitting his army and leading the light infantry and cavalry ahead to try and cut off Labienus. Ventidius was able to overtake Labienus around the Taurus Mountains, encamping on the high ground. Ventidius was hesitant to attack with only his light infantry, and so a standoff ensued, Ventidius waiting for his heavy infantry and Labienus for his Parthian allies. This carried on for almost a week, until the reinforcements for both sides arrived apparently on the same day. Ventidius kept his entire force on the high ground, but the reinforcing Parthians, buoyed by their victory over Saxa the previous year, did not wait to coordinate an attack with Labienus, forming up at the base of the hill for battle. The standard Roman military doctrine was to draw up for battle in front of an encampment so as not to be surrounded, as can be seen from Caesar's tactics at Sella, for instance. Ventidius, though, kept his force in camp. Encouraged by this perceived cowardice, the Parthians began to charge up the incline. Once they were part way up the slope, however, Ventidius suddenly ordered his men to sally out and attack. Caught unawares and fighting uphill, 
the Parthian cavalry stood little chance against the heavy Roman infantry, and many were killed before quickly routing. The stampede of horses downhill caused even more casualties, and the Parthians fled the field completely, leaving Labienus and his men deployed in battle formation outside their camp. Ventidius marshaled his forces once again, but did not attack Labienus. The latter had been relying upon the Parthians for the battle, and with them routed, it is peculiar that Ventidius did not press home his advantage, though he may have wanted to avoid exhausting his men, or perhaps attempted to negotiate with Labienus to surrender. Whichever the reason, both forces returned to their encampments for the night. At this point, Labienus attempted to slip away in the darkness, but deserters from his camp informed Ventidius of this. He quickly took action, ambushing Labienus's retreating force in the night, killing a number of them and capturing the rest. What exactly happened to Labienus next is unclear. Cassius says he was able to slip away, but was soon arrested and executed, while Festus claims he was killed in the ambush. Whatever the case, it is clear that Ventidius had won an impressive victory, thus securing Asia Minor. In order to safeguard Cilicia against any counterattack, Ventidius marched his force to the Amanus Pass, bordering Syria. Finding it garrisoned by the Parthians, Ventidius had two legions wait in ambush, while he sent a force of cavalry ahead to provoke the Parthians. The Roman cavalry feigned a retreat, luring the Parthians directly into Ventidius's trap. The legions sprung to the attack, killing many Parthians, including their commander, and routing the rest. Upon hearing news of their second defeat, Pacorus, the Parthian prince, withdrew the remainder of his forces from Syria. Ventidius was thus able to retake the remainder of the province without a fight. Ventidius then began the process of re-administering the provinces, including sending a small detachment of his force to Herod, the Roman-supported son of the deposed king of Judea, in order to try and retake the kingdom from the Parthian-installed Antigonus. The Parthian invasion had only been stalled, though it had not been completely halted. At the start of the following year, 38 BC, Pacorus began amassing a second invasion force, totaling between 20 and 30,000 soldiers. At this time, Ventidius's legions were still in their winter quarters, and some in Cappadocia. According to Cassius Dio, in order to buy himself more time, Ventidius used a local prince, who was known to be close to the Parthians, to spread disinformation. The prince claimed that Ventidius was not afraid of the Parthians crossing the Euphrates in their usual place near Zugma, saying that the legions would easily be able to hold the crossing thanks to the hilly terrain, but that he was worried about the Parthians crossing further down the river, where the flat plains would make it difficult for his men to fight the Parthian cavalry. Pacorus, as a result of this, aimed for the flat plains, wasting as many as 40 days marching his army downstream and building a bridge. This was enough time for Ventidius to muster his forces and be prepared for the invasion. Though this is the version of events given by Cassius Dio, some modern historians have questioned it. They point out justifiably that our only source for the events is Roman, and thus would have an undeniable bias against the Parthians, depicting them as gullible and easily fooled. Pacorus was a talented commander, and some therefore think it is unlikely that he would have been so easily hoodwinked. It has also been suggested that Pacorus deliberately waited for Ventidius to amass his legions in order to be able to hopefully strike one decisive blow and destroy the Roman army in the east in one battle. In either scenario, the outcome is the same. Ventidius had enough time to gather his army to counter Pacorus. The forces met around Mount Gindaris, Ventidius once again encamping on the high ground. His army of perhaps four legions plus light infantry was approximately the same size as Pacorus's, but since his victories the previous year, Ventidius had also incorporated slingers into his army, likely from local populations. When the Parthians drew up for battle, Ventidius once again used the same ploy as before, keeping his army inside their camp to lure the Parthians close. The Parthian horse archers advanced up the slope first, and Ventidius waited until the last moment to unleash part of his force. Some of the Parthians were caught by this sally and cut down, 
the remainder retreating past the Roman fort with part of Ventidius's force in pursuit. Pacorus, assuming that his horse archers had lured out the entirety of Ventidius's army, now advanced uphill towards the camp with his cataphracts. Suddenly, Ventidius attacked with the remainder of his legions and slingers. With the advantage of the high ground, they were able to easily blunt the charge of the cataphracts and repel them, forcing them back down the hill. Pacorus was able to rally his men at the base of the hill and organized a proper resistance. The Parthians, however, found themselves under a hail of missiles from the Roman slingers on the high ground, and Pacorus was killed in the fighting. Some of his guard fought fiercely for his body, but a combination of Roman heavy infantry and intense fire from the slingers proved too much, the Parthian army breaking completely. Parts of the army attempted to flee back across the Euphrates, but were cut off and killed, others successfully managing to reach the safety of Comageni, a Parthian ally. The majority of the Parthian army, however, had been killed. Ventidius's casualties are unknown, but they seem to have been minimal, as he immediately marched to Comageni and besieged the capital. Antony arrived from Greece soon afterwards, taking over the siege and accepting tribute from the Comageni king in return for peace. Antony seems to have been somewhat jealous of Ventidius's achievements, and not without reason. Ventidius had won three battles in succession, including Rome's first victory over a full Parthian army, and the death of Pacorus sparked a succession crisis in Parthia, further securing Rome's eastern border. Antony removed the general from command, and Ventidius returned to Rome a hero, becoming the first Roman to be awarded a triumph for a victory over the Parthians. Ventidius then disappears from the historical record, the assumption being that he died soon afterwards, though whether by natural causes or not is unknown. The death of Quintus Labienus meant that there was effectively only one Pompeian leader left, Sextus Pompey. And while Ventidius had been securing the east, the peace that had been agreed at Misenum had frayed quickly. While Antony was in Athens, Sextus had requested control of the province of Achaea as agreed. In return, Antony demanded the tax revenue of the province in order to fund his Parthian campaign, a demand that Sextus refused. To make matters worse for Sextus, one of his generals and governors, Menas, had defected to Octavian, handing over control of Sardinia and three legions. In response, Sextus had once again sent out his fleet to pirate the Mediterranean, and by the start of 38 BC, the peace was in tatters. War, once again, loomed on the horizon. We shall cover this war between the Caesarians and Sextus Pompey in the upcoming episode, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.